other people tromped around in woods and fields and through Nachusa grasslands, learning how to not only identify plants, which was, I guess, heaven for us plant nerds, but also how to um, look at a site and, and think about whether it is what we think of as a high quality site or not. Um, and from that experience, I can truly say that Chris is a really great teacher. Uh, besides being a teacher, he's a botanist, he's a public speaker, he's a researcher, a photographer, and author. Uh, he is a past president of Illinois Native Plant Society, which is, I'm just going to put a plug in here, if you love plants and you love Illinois plants, then you, you should probably join. Um, uh, re, and he's a researcher at Southern Illinois University, he, where he teaches, and he also um, coordinates the Plants of Concern for Southern Illinois, which is a very valuable program uh, that engages citizen scientists to help monitor rare and endangered species. Uh, we have a Northern uh, chapter up here, and I participate in it, and uh, again, it's something that any one of you who are in the audience could could take part in and help contribute to scientific uh, efforts in the state. Um, he also uh, conducts botanical field work around the world, teaches at Morton Arboretum, leads nature tours, uh, and has research appointments with the University of Illinois and Argonne National Laboratory. So I'm very pleased and uh, happy to have Chris take over and talk to us about spring ephemeral wildflowers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I definitely appreciate the invitation to speak to you all virtually uh, about spring ephemeral wildflowers. So we see a beautiful scene here that I took at the LaRue Pine Hills Research Natural Area, which is in Union County, Illinois. So as Adrian mentioned, my name is Chris Benda and I currently work at Southern Illinois University coordinating the Plants of Concern program. You can also find me online under the moniker Illinois Botanizer. My website is appropriately named IllinoisBotanizer.com. And I have my speaking schedule listed there. And a lot of the events like this one I do virtually. So that allows for people to participate. And often the presentations are recorded and, and put online as well. So there are plenty of opportunities to hear about interesting topics that I have uh, discussed in Illinois. Um, I have a YouTube channel that has some videos that I created and I try to post to Facebook and Instagram somewhat regularly. Also on my website, um, there is a basically a repository for um, plant photos. I've been botanizing in Illinois for almost 20 years. So I have taken a lot of photos of plants in the state and I've started to, started to put together um, plant pages for all the different species that we have in the state. And if you're interested in st staying a little more connected with um, what my events are, you can subscribe to the mailing list and I try to send out reminders uh, for upcoming programs. So check all that out at IllinoisBotanizer.com. Another thing that you may be interested in uh, is a class that I developed for the Morton Arboretum, an online class called Botanical Names Demystified. And uh, it's on demand, so I believe you can enroll at any time, and you have, I think, 90 days to go through the course. Um, and it talks about the importance of botanical names and why they're used and what they mean and various interesting information that might help you uh, learn plants if you better understand the, their names. I also do uh, teach a, a spring wildflower course at the Morton Arboretum that is also online. Um, it's called Identify Woodland Wildflowers. So that will be starting up um, in April, I believe. So check that out at the Morton Arboretum website as well. And then here's a little icebreaker slide that's a, it's a joke about how uh, not all the time people really want to talk about plants. And so sometimes they have to be creative to sneak botany into the innocent con uh, con conversation topic there with the Trojan horse meme. So Illinois is a pretty diverse state, um, relatively speaking. You know, it's kind of a large state, at least large compared to the eastern states. Uh, there's approximately 3,600 species or so, uh, native and non-native, you know, wild occurring, spontaneously growing plants um, in nature. 
Uh, of course, you know, Illinois is uh, kind of in the center of the United States and in its, um, you know, has a lot of diversity because in the northern part of the state, there's a lot of plants that adapted to the northern parts of North America and the southern part of the state is the same, but for southern species. So it really is sort of uh, sandwiched in different uh, eco regions that definitely bring a lot of the diversity in plant life to Illinois. I thought I would start here with just a, a quick slide too that shows some of the basic uh, wildflower resources that people may enjoy. Uh, for Illinois, we do have Don Kurz's uh, excellent Illinois Wildflowers book that is a lot of beautiful photography. It's arranged by color, which is often preferred for um, beginners. Um, it's not comprehensive is sort of the issue there. So it'll definitely have a lot of the common plants and common genera of plants in Illinois, uh, but for something a little more comprehensive and and focused not only on wildflowers, I like to highlight Newcomb's Wildflower Guide. That is essentially the resource that I used to learn plants, kind of self-taught um, with his Wildflower Guide that uses drawings. And it's for Eastern North America, but a lot of what is covered in there occurs in Illinois. And also, um, at least in the southern part of, of Illinois, we share a lot of our flora with Missouri, and w Missouri has a wildflower book as well. That is uh, an excellent resource. And I will mention that uh, I contributed photography to a new wildflower book called Wildflowers of the Midwest uh, by Mike Kamoya and Scott Nemesnik out of Indiana. So that is a more of a regional guide uh, that is, you know, photography based. It's got a lot of content. So I'll definitely plug the uh, Wildflowers of the Midwest book released last year. So here's a beautiful scene at Giant City State Park, which is very close to my home in Jackson County. And it shows a, a nice assemblage there of spring ephemeral wildflowers. So the idea here with the spring ephemeral plants is that they occur in shaded mesic woods so there's not a lot of light that makes it's a it's full canopy or nearly full canopy uh, of tree foliage so not a lot of light makes its way to the forest floor and of course plants need light to grow and to photosynthesize and to make food so these spring ephemeral plants occur early in the springtime where they can grow photosynthesize and reproduce all in just a few weeks time uh, before the trees put out their leaves for the growing season. So have a very short window to maximize um, growth and reproduction based on available light. So generally these areas are very rich. There's a lot of organic matter in the soil. They're, they're moist on the moist end of things. And so they're productive and you can get a lot of spring ephemerals that occur in these places. Um, I should mention that I use the word spring ephemeral quite loosely in this talk, and it's definitely has definitely referring to plants that bloom in the spring and that are ephemeral in as far as their flowers are concerned. But I want to make the distinction known that true spring ephemeral plants, the entire plant disappears in a few weeks. Not it's not just the flower. So trout lily, Dutchman's breeches. Um, uh, the uh, the trilliums, well, trilliums kind of hang out for a while, I suppose. But a lot, of, a lot of the plants like bloodroot, you know, the flowers are very short lived, but the leaves stay throughout the summer. You know, Jacob's ladder, phlox, all of those plants you can easily identify in late summer by just um, the leaves that sort of remain through the growing season. So a lot of the plants here are are. Um, spring bloomers, but they may persist throughout the year. I mean, even May apple, you can identify May apple, you know, into September in a lot of the woods. So maybe perhaps not a true spring ephemeral, um, but I want to make that distinction. So I mentioned some of my favorites here, sort of chronologically, the harbinger of spring, as the name implies, is an early spring wildflower. These are actually already blooming uh, in Southern Illinois. I've seen a number of of posts about them. And you can see my the car key to my Toyota 4Runner there on the picture that really shows how small they are. You kind of look for them and thinking, I'm not sure I see any. And then you got to look closely and get, you know, get your search image and your eyes tuned and you can find that cute little wildflower there in 
some pretty rich sites, um, you know, generally high quality areas that will have the, the Harbinger of Spring. And I also mentioned that um, Adrian said how is past president of the Illinois Native Plant Society and how you should join. And I am the editor of our state newsletter, which is a quarterly newsletter, and it's called The Harbinger. Uh, and the journal, was, which is more scientific articles in that for the Illinois Native Plant Society, is called Aerogenia. So Aerogenia and Harbinger of Spring are kind of the uh, poster child plants for Illinois Native Plant Society. But this is a carrot in the carrot family. It has beautiful um, dark purple stamens with the white petals. Now, of course, another really early bl blooming uh, wildflower is the spring beauty, Claytonia virginiana. And interesting about this plant is it's one of the first wildflowers to bloom in the spring. You know, you find them in, in March um, or February, even late February, because I had seen some uh, blooming already this year. But they bloom late into the into this, uh, spring season as well. So even into May, sometimes you can still find uh, spring beauties blooming. So they have a long window of their, their bloom time, but uh, generally it is in the spring time of the year. And they have very slender leaves, as you can see, and they vary in the amount of purple or pink streaking on the petals. Sometimes the petals are pure white. Sometimes they're almost entirely pink with the pink striations that can be found there. And basically, that's a genetic difference that has to do with pollination. So bees and insects are often drawn to the, what they call like the landing strip of the petals that they're drawn into the the, the colors and the, they, you know, they see things differently. And so petals that are pink are more likely to be pollinated by insect pollinators, but the petals that are white are generally um, less likely to be um, eaten by predators. So there's sort of, you know, the cost benefit ratio there of what strategies a plant want to employ to best reproduce and avoid being eaten. So interesting strategies there by the spring beauty. And bloodroot is one of my favorites. It's a, in the poppy family. There's there's only uh, two native poppies actually in Illinois. It's uh, the celandine, um, well, I like to call wood poppy, celandine poppy, the styloferum, uh, and then this bloodroot, sanguinaria canadensis. Of course, the name bloodroot refers to the sap in the roots and stems of this plant. They're kind of an orange color, blood-like, and they're used for dye, used for you know war paint with indigenous tribes and things like that. So there, it's really a, a, a neat one in that regard. It has very interesting looking leaves, but the flowers only bloom for really about a day. So they're very ephemeral and you have to really get out uh, early and at the right time to see the mass blooms of the bloodroot plant. And something interesting about them is some of a lot of these spring ephemerals, including bloodroot, have these seeds that are covered in eliasomes. The eliasome is a fatty, rich in protein tissue, basically, that surrounds the seed. And so the ants are interested in eating this uh, fatty tissue. So I like to call it ant bacon, that the seeds are covered in ant bacon. And the seeds want the, the ants carry the seeds and disperse them so that they can consume this fatty tissue. And then the seed is too hard for an ant to consume. And so it's discarded in their waste area, which of course is rich in fertilizer. Um, and that's how the seeds are dispersed. So Dutchman's breeches do this and trout lily and a good number of other spring plants. And some, a lot of sedges too um, are dispersed by ants. And of course, there's a fancy word for this phenomenon that's called myrmecockery. And myrmecockery is ant dispersal. So really interesting thing about some of these spring ephemerals. Now, another early blooming plant that I really enjoy is hepatica. It's called liver leaf. Um, this, the, the, this was named according to the doctrine of signatures, which you may have heard of. And that was a, a sort of a belief that was embraced by herbalists at the time, you know, long ago that said if a plant looked like a body organ that it was marked by God and was intended to be used to treat ailments uh, of that particular organ. So since this plant has three lobes on the leaves, like a liver, and they turn, you know, dark maroon, liver colored uh, late in the year, they was once believed to be a cure for liver disease. And that's how it got the name liver leaf. 
course, liver leaf is in the Ranunculaceae, which is the buttercup family, which are largely toxic plants. Um, although toxic plants are sometimes used medicinally um, in, in certain doses. Uh, but this one doesn't have any medicinal, pure medicinal value, but that's how it got the name. Another interesting thing is that it can vary quite a bit in flower color. Technically, what we are looking at here are not petals, but they are sepals. Um, it's a little intricacies of the flower anatomy, but the sepals can be white. Uh, they're often pink or in some cases, even like a blue or purple, as you see in this photo. I took this photo at the Garden of the Gods Wilderness, and I used to lead regular uh, nature tours through there. And I would visit this plant, this specific plant annually and see the beautiful blue flowers on it. But I haven't been there uh, in a number of years. So very early bloomer, the hepatica. And then again, the leaves, the foliage actually persists throughout the year. And they can be quite um, beautiful as well, as you see in this photo. I took this photo at Franklin Creek Conservation Area, which is in Lee County. And you can see this quite mottled leaves uh, on them. So one of my favorites for sure is Hepatica. Now, the garden vervain, just sometimes called the um, sand vervain um, or rose, rose verbena is another name. It's interesting that I see this wildflower mostly in people's yards. It's very uh, popular in the nursery trade, but I rarely encounter it in the wild, um, especially in the southern part of the state where I live. But a number of years ago, I spied these purple blooming plants from the Snake Road at LaRue Pine Hills, and I climbed up to the, the limestone glade slash hill prairie to see the wonderful native plant, the garden ravine. So very easily to incorporate in your home landscaping. And it is quite a beautiful wildflower. Moving on to the marsh marigold, I studied Blanding's turtles in graduate school. And Blanding's turtles like um, you know wetlands, like a lot of turtles do. So this was a flower that when I was doing the early spring work with Blanding's turtles, I would encounter all the time. This, this marsh marigold, it prefers uh, calcareous wetlands. Calcareous meaning they're alkaline or basic on the pH scale. So plants have a pretty narrow pH tolerance, just like humans and, and most organisms. Uh, and some, you know, prefer things more on the basic end, like the marsh marigold. And it blooms in, I would say, early April, perhaps late May. And, you know, one thing interesting about this, uh, when I was doing work with the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory and there was surveying for seep springs in Illinois, often a strategy employed was to go by airplane and fly over, you know, areas where you think there may be seep springs. And if you go when the marsh marigold was blooming, you just see this, uh, you know, burst of yellow um, that's easily visible from an airplane, and that could indicate a high quality seep spring area. So they they definitely took advantage of the the proliferous blooms of this showy wildflower to help surveying for that rare community type. Also a buttercup, and then Dutchman's breeches here is another standard uh, classic that everybody knows. The interesting looking wildflowers it. So some people have this in the poppy family. I said earlier there was only two native poppies. Uh, it, it depends on what taxonomy you follow. The Dutchman's breeches and its relatives are in the fu fu fumatory family by some authorities. Um, but in any event, they are very ephemeral plants with, I think, beautiful foliage as well as the, the, the pants there, that the flowers that look like little Dutchman's pants hanging out to dry. And I, I guess apparently I didn't put the, uh, the red pinkish colored one in this slideshow that was uh, advertised on the event, which was a very uh, excellent selection. Uh, I, I joke and say that the Dutchman put his red handkerchief in with his whitey tidies and the, and the laundry came out pink. That's what you how you explain those pink wildflowers when you see them. Um, actually, the picture on the event um, posting was taken in Cook County at Swallow Cliff. That's where I saw the pink Dutchman's breeches. But as I was saying, the foliage is quite attractive as well, as you can see in that picture. And then a, a similar cousin to Dutchman's breeches is the squirrel corn, which typically blooms a little bit later, but there is a little bit of overlap. Um, and you can see the flowers look quite different, more, more like a bleeding heart there, which is also closely related to these. Um, but bleeding hearts are not native in Illinois, although they are popular in the nursery trade. 
And then in the same group of plants here, the Corydalis or Corydalis, there's um, a couple species that are common in Illinois with these uh, interesting yellow flowers. And without the flowers on Dutchman's breeches or Corydalis, they're, they can be quite difficult to identify because the foliage does look quite similar. Um, but that is another beautiful wildflower. And another early flowering one is the toothwort. And toothwort is in the mustard family. I can go back one here. So this used to be Dentaria laciniata, which I really liked because Dentaria relates to dens, meaning tooth, and laciniata means finely divided or cut leaf, uh, and this was called cut leaf toothwort. But, you know, those pesky taxonomists are always uh, making revisions, and so now this is placed in the genus Cardamine. It's Cardamine concatenata is the updated botanical name. But as I said, this is a, a mustard. They were the crucifers because they have the four petals um, on the wildflower. And closely related to other uh, cardamines in Illinois, the cardamine bulbosa, spring cress, and cardamine douglasii, they call purple cress. And they, the, the purple cress is more of a northern species. Um, their petals are typically a little more purple than white, but they also have a hairy stem. So there's a few differences between those two spring mustard plants. And then the rue anemone, this is the true rue. And true rue anemone is Thelictrum thelictroides, which is kind of a hilarious name. Oides means similar to, so it's the Thelictrum that resembles a Thelictrum, which is really, like I said, quite silly. But in any event, um, it does grow in woodlands early in the spring. Typically, there's more than five petals versus the false rue anemone, um, which typically has five petals. Um, but there are other differences as well in the foliage and, and others. Here's the false rue anemone, which was uh, anemion bitternatum. You see the five-petaled white flowers there on that. The, the false rue anemone is, is colonial, so it grows in large patches where the true rue is solitary. So that's one difference uh, between them as well. Now, blue cohosh is another one of my favorite plants. It's kind of got a also a silly name, I think. Um, Colophyllum or colophyllum. Colo means stem and phylum means leaf. So it translates to stem leaf. And you think, well, that's not really very interesting for a plant to be called a stem leaf. Um, but it's true that there is a single stem that terminates at a single leaf um, that's very divided at the top. So that's where the name comes from. It's one of the plants that I call a confused dicot because the dicots or the eudicots as they're more uh, called these days, typically have flower parts in fours and fives and the monocots have flower parts in threes or multiples of threes. So we see six petals on here, which would suggest a monocot, but it's actually a dicot. So the confused dicot and it also has um, leaves similar to a thelictrum, even though it's not related to thelictrum at all. Thelictrum is a buttercup, but blue cohosh is a barberry. It's related, it's in the barberidaceae. It's related to mayapple and in Japanese barberry, honestly. So that's interesting. Lastly, I will say this plant, along with wood betony, um, are interesting to me in that in Illinois, I only have seen yellow flowering individuals. But if you see these two species farther east, even in Kentucky, which isn't that far to the east, they're maroon. They're more of a burgundy color. But in Illinois, they're always yellow. And this is a conservative species, meaning that you're only going to find it in intact, high quality sites. Uh, bluebells, on the other hand, are much more general in their distribution, and they will you know, hang on in disturbed areas to some degree. They're not necessarily conservative, but they grow in large patches, and everybody is excited to see big expanses of Virginia bluebells, um, which are quite common in Illinois woodlands throughout the state. So this is a borash in the borash family, but the the petals, instead of flaring out like most borages do, they're united into a tube or a little bell. So they make that bell shape to them. Um, the buds start out pink. So often the petals are more of a pink color when they're developing and then they turn blue. And sometimes you can even find white flowered individuals, which are quite rare. It's, a, again, a genetic uh, difference, um, but sometimes come across the white flowering individuals for that. 
Now, here is the meadow rue. So you're wondering, what is the thelictrum name? What what is the rue? Well, the rue genus is 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 thelictrum, and this particular one is thelictrum dioecum, which the other species in in Illinois are really summer bloomers. But this is called the early meadow rue, and the plants are dioecious, and that means that individuals are either male or female, but not together on the same plant. So you can see. The left photo are the dangling stamens there of a male individual. And then on the right are the white stigmas on the flowers for um, the female plants. So they look like they could be totally different species, but this is the same thing. They're just uh, different, um, different um, some, are, some are female organs and some are males. Now, this here is really interesting. We don't have this in the southern part of the state. It's one of my favorites, um, false mermaid weed. It, it, it has a funny name there, Flor Florichia uh, proserpinacoides. And again, there's that oides similar to, and it's similar to proserpinaca, which of course is mermaid weed. So this is the false mermaid weed. Kind of the funny thing about that is um, if you've seen mermaid weed, it was just a wetland plant. Um, I don't really see much resemblance. So it's kind of a funny name that uh, they decided to name it proserpinacoides. But as you can see in the in the woodland here, if I move the photo there, um, it's like a lime green color covering the forest floor. They, they, they occur really early in the spring and then they're, they just disappear. So you, if you go back in June or July, you know, you won't see this scene at, at all. I think I took this photo at Thatcher Woods, which is also in Cook County. So a good spring ephemeral conservative plant is the false mermaid weed. Now, some trout lilies. Uh, interesting about the trout lilies is that in northern Illinois, the white trout lily is much more common than yellow trout lily. But in the southern part of the state, the opposite is true. You can find yellows widespread, but the white uh, trout lilies are more restricted in where they occur. I took this picture at Maple Lake, which is also in Cook County. You can see the white trout lilies there. Now, this um, I've read some things about telling these the yellows from the whites apart without flowers. Um, I contend that they are unidentifiable without flowers. And you need to see flower color to really identify the species. Um, but here is the yellow version, which I took this photo at um, uh, down in Crab Orchard National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, so moving on here, we have wild ginger, another neat uh, plant. And this, you know, these persist throughout the summer, even though the flowers are really early in the spring. They have maroon colored flowers, which typically maroon colored wildflowers um, emit a fetid odor like skunk cabbage and uh, pawpaw and, and plants like that. Um, the ill-scented trillium is named so because the maroon flowers emit a foul odor because they're attracting carrion feeders like beetles and flies and insects that are attracted to rotting flesh. So they often have a, a foul smell um, and they're luring in those, those pollinators. Now, what's interesting about wild ginger is the, the flowers are at the base of the plant. You know, typically a wildflower is going to be high advertising to flying insects, you know, hey, come over here, visit me move the pollen around, um, but the beetles and flies that are active in the early spring are often down in the leaf litter, and that's why the flowers then are, are at the base of the plant. And also for beneficial for the insect is that in the springtime, it can still be pretty cool. We can have cool days, the nights can be cold. So by having a little urn-shaped wildflower at the base of the plant, the leaf litter helps insulate everything and keep it warmer. So the, the plants are getting pollinators to visit and, and move pollen around. Um, and the insects are having a little uh, um, shelter for the cool nights and cool days by hiding in the wild ginger there. Now, golden seal is one of my favorites. Another interesting thing is that very rare in Chicago region and pretty rare in Eastern North America. But in Southern Illinois, golden seal is in every woods. It's you, I encounter it all the time. Um, but they do have interesting wildflowers. They have no petals. So you see a little ring of white things. Those are stamens. There's basically a, the, the stigma style ovary in the center, but the white parts are, are just stamens with no petals. And they're quite showy and they do bloom very early, um, but the leaves persist throughout the year. Now, May Apple here is another one that um, is similar to Golden Seal and Trout Lily in that 
sterile individuals or reproductively immature plants have a single leaf. And then when they are mature and we're ready to reproduce, they will grow a second leaf and always have two leaves when they bloom. So trout lilies like this, you might see an area with just lots of single leaves of, of trout lily. Trout lily takes seven years to mature to um, reproduce. And that's because they're only photosynthesizing for a few weeks every year. They're having to store, it takes a lot of energy to produce a flower. And so they're storing energy year after year in the roots until they have enough to to start to be reproductive. And that's what's happening with May apple as well. The May apple have a single leaf. They, uh, I have seen single leaved individuals uh, with a flower, but it's very rare. Typically uh, the two leaved individuals will have the wildflower and the flowers are underneath the leaves on this case. And they produce uh, a nice large fruit. Um, all parts of the plant are poisonous to humans, except for the ripe fruit. Uh, and the fruit is is often eaten by box turtles. Box turtles will move the seeds around. So that's interesting dispersal for the May apple plant, which I mentioned earlier is uh, in the barberry family, the Barbaridaceae, Podophyllum peltatum. Now, Hori Bakun is also uh, uh, one of my favorite plants for sure. And this is, again, another conservative species in Illinois. That's why Aldo Leopold said in uh, San, San County Almanac, Pacoons only converse with the dead. And he was meaning that he only found Pacoon in pioneer cemetery prairies, areas that had been set aside and preserved for burials. And so they were never plowed, whereas the landscape outside of these areas, most of the prairie had been plowed or utilized in one way or another. And so you, he wasn't seeing Pacoon widespread on the landscape. It was relegated to uh, high quality habitats of which not many remain, uh, but some of some of which that does is in these cemetery prairies that were set aside in the 1800s for burial. So this is Hori Pacoon, Lithospermum canescens, and there are a few other Pacoons. We have a hairy Pacoon, we have a fringed Pacoon, uh, but this one's probably the most common of them. French is shooting star. Now we have common shooting star throughout the state in every county in Illinois, but just in the southern portion of the state, we have the rare French is shooting star named after George Hazen French, an uh, early botanist at Southern Illinois University. So this grows only in sandstone uh, ravines and canyons in the Greater Shawnee Hills Natural Division. So you find it along what they call the drip line, where the water runs off cliffs and drips onto the, the base. Uh, that's a lot along the base of cliffs and under overhangs. That's where the species occurs. It's not actually all that rare uh, in Southern Illinois. There are lots of sites with it, but it's very restricted in its distribution. And then buttercups. There are 29 species of buttercups in Illinois in the ranunculus genus. And this is a common one, the swamp buttercup, ranunculus septentrionalis. I'll leave it at that. Um, and now here are bell warts in Illinois. Uh, up until last year, until uh, last April, we only had or were aware of two bellwort species in Illinois. The large uh, flowered bellwort, which is um, on the left, which is common throughout the state. And then the cecil bellwort, Uvularia cecilifolia, which does occur in the Chicago region. It's, it's, it's very, um, it's, I would say, uncommon throughout Illinois, but I know of a number of populations but then last year at a site where really, I guess botanists just including myself kind of all assumed the Cecil bellwort um, existed was actually the Florida bellwort. So this is a new species discovered in Illinois last year. And there are several differences, but mainly the flowering, the stem with the flowers on it has a leaf attached to it. And that's called a bract. So that presence of that bract on the stalk of the wildflower makes that set this apart from other um, bellworts like the Cecil bellwort. And as you can see in the distribution map, it's not really common where it's known currently, mostly um, in the southeastern states. But um, so it's a little bit of a jump for it to be in Illinois. And it's probably not a recent range expansion. It's probably been there under our noses all along. Um, it was found at Heron Pond, which is a heavily botanized site. So addition to the state flora is really uh, exciting. And that happened last year. Now violets, there are 32 species in Illinois in the viola genus, so lots of violets. And most of them, most of the violets are violet colored, uh, but somewhat uh, ironically, then we have some non-violet violets like cream violet or yellow violet. Um, 
Interesting thing too is that violets often produce uh, cleistogamous flowers. And that's a fancy way of saying they're self-fertilized. So those, those flowers are usually at the base of the plant. They're very hidden because they don't actually need to bloom because they're they're selfing. They're fertilizing themselves. So they're they don't really need to to create showy wildflowers or attract any pollinators. But they are technically flowers that the plants produce and allows them to to clone themselves essentially. So that's the interesting thing about violets. And then Jack in the pulpit, this is this fascinating story. So these are, are hermaphroditic plants. They actually can be male one year or female later. You know, typically the male flowers are cheaper to produce as far as uh, energy resources. So often plants are male early in life when they don't have a lot of energy. And then as they mature, uh, they become female. Uh, but this one, it can actually have male and female flowers together or either or or different, uh, depending on what year and the resources available. So what's happening is when they are truly dioecious, meaning only male or only female, they're pollinated by fungal gnats. And these gnats make their way down into the pulpit. This is this is in the arum family, right? So the spade and the spadix are the unique flower uh, anatomy of that family. And so the little point sticking out that's jack right that's the flower stalk and then the pulpit is a, just basically a, a it's the spade it's just leaf tissue so a fungal ant will make its way down into the tube uh and there's no nectar reward so it's kind of a a, a fool's errand that a, a, a gnat will run down into the tube and then bounce around you know on the on the pistol and well i guess in this case it would be the stamens um if it's a male flower and get pollen all over itself now at the base of the plant now flies and gnats just like birds they have a hard time being able to fly up and out if you have if you had a bird in a barn you know they they fly up they can't figure out how to like go through a door easily and so the same thing is true with jack in the pulpit the gnats fly up and they hit the shroud and they kind of just go back down um, so what it has is on the male flowers at the base of the spade is a little escape hatch there's a little hole in the way that it wraps together and they can basically fly down and get out through the escape hatch. But if it's a female plant, that is not present. So the male plants, you know, want insects to visit, get covered in pollen, and then they need to escape to go, um, you know, fertilize a female. But the females don't have any reason to let the insect or the gnat escape. So they, the gnat flies around, banging around and dropping all the pollen that it had carried um, on the female plants. So a little fascinating thing about this. The, the, the roots and the seeds are also made of calcium oxalate, which is the same substance as a kidney stone. So if you want to experience what it would take, what it would be like to eat a kidney stone, you can eat a jack in the pulpit seed and it's, it won't kill you, but it's very unpleasant. It's burning sensation. It used to be sort of a, a prank that I've, I've heard. I've, it's kind of a mean prank, but I have heard that, um, you know, someone may pull this on someone else, convincing them to eat Jack in the Pulpit seeds. And it's just a terrible uh, experience and sensation. But they did call this Indian turnip. So indigenous uh, peoples were using this as food at one point, probably boiling it and, and preparing it for that. It's closely related to green dragon, which they both bloom in the early spring. And the green dragon has a spade and spadix flower as well, but different leaves and different looking flowers for these two closely related species. Now, Jacob's Ladder is another one I think is just gorgeous wildflower. It's this this color of blue is just seems rarely found in the wild. Um, and you can see the paired leaves look like a little ladder. It's well, it gets its name and it will bloom um, for quite a long time or uh, not bloom, but uh, the leaves persist uh, throughout the summer. So it's one you can identify later in the year. And then we have fern leaf phacelia. This is one that is in the, it is in the water leaf family. A lot of people mistake it for water leaf, which is in the hydrophyllum uh, genus, but this is Phacelia, but it does have the mottled leaves that look like water spots. Um, Phacelia bipenitifida is quite common um, in woodlands throughout Illinois. And then the true water leaves, most common in the northern part of the state is the Virginia water leaf. You may have seen it has long protruding stamens quite showy wildflower it grows in huge abundance it seems so you can often find just big monocultures of virginia water leaf and then in other parts of the state more common is the great water leaf with which is um, hydrophyllum appendiculatum and it's sometimes also called appendaged water leaf 
And that's what appendiculatum is referring to the appendage. If you look at this photo, it's really hard to see, but um, the long green pointy parts under the petal, those are called sepals. And in between those sepals is another little green um, piece of tissue that's actually pointing down toward my fingers. And that is the appendage. And that is how you can identify the appendage water leaf compared to other similar species. Phlox is another one. I, I like phlox because uh, we call the, the scientific name is phlox. The common name is phlox. I think we would be better served if we had more examples of that. I mean, we do have geranium as geranium and hydrangea as hydrangea and trillium as trillium and sassafras as sassafras. So there's a number of instances where the, the genus of the wildflower is the same as the common name. And I like when I like that. It's easier to learn. So phlox is a good example. There are a number of different phlox species in Illinois. This is Probably the most common, the woodland phlox, phlox to varicata. Also can vary a bit from purple to blue, pink colors. Uh, but here's what we call a full glorious bloom of cleft phlox, phlox bifida. You can see the cleft petals uh, on that species. And this is at LaRue Pine Hills and the talus slopes there. Uh, here's wild hyacinth, which I also love. This is at Cape Creek Glade in Johnson County. The base of the glade gets a nice explosion of wild hyacinth later in the spring. Another mass bloom here happens with blue-eyed marys. We have lots of sites in the southern part of the state that have big expanses of this. This is a, an annual or maybe a biennial, so individual plants are short-lived. They, they germinate in the wintertime, which is kind of interesting, and they have that bicolored petal where part's blue and, and part is uh, white. So this is super showy. Uh, beautiful wildflower. And then this one also persists throughout the year, but you know, down in the southern part of the state, it, it really blooms early. So I put it in with the spring mix, the violet wood sorrel, uh, Oxalis violacea, which in Chicago region is actually quite a conservative plant. Um, there's not a lot of necessarily a lot of locations for it, but I took this photo in my driveway, the gravel driveway. So it's a, it's much more um, of a generalist in the southern portion of the state. And then I thought I'd go through all the trilliums. There's nine species of trilliums in Illinois. The earliest blooming one is the snow trillium. As the name implies, it does uh, grow and often early in spring when there's still snow on the ground. And sometimes it does a little thermogenesis where it's actually heating up the area around uh, the plant, melting the snow so that the plants can grow and bloom. They're, it's a little misleading here in the photo. They're, they're hard to see how small they are. They are pretty small. Um, and it's it's uh, throughout northern and central Illinois, um, a number of sites, but not the easiest one necessarily to go find. It's not in your, your average woods. Um, but there are places around. Another one here that is a little more widespread is the Trillium grandiflorum. Great white trillium mixed in with some bloodroot leaves there. Uh, and then I mentioned the ill-scented trillium. As the name implies there is... is um, often has a foul odor to attract carrion feeders. And this is quite rare in Illinois. I think there's really just a couple counties where you can find Trillium erectum, but it is in the nursery trade as well. And then down the Southern part of the state, more commonly we have the white Trillium, Trillium flexipes, which is a quite a large plant, large flowers, large leaves, um, and conservative spring ephemeral. The purple trillium is the most common one across the state. It's in every single county. It's got a lot of common names, Bloody Butcher and uh, Wake Robin and, and such. Um, I, I tend to see it called prairie trillium a lot too, but you know it grows in woodlands uh, where I live, but it is, it is pretty common and easy to find. But there is a, a, variety, a form of it where the petals are actually yellow instead of maroon. So that's forma luteum. Which they call a yellow trillium, not to be confused with trillium luteum, which is yellow trillium. We don't have that in Illinois. It's in the Appalachian Mountains, but we have a yellow petaled uh, prairie trillium. And then even more rare is the chaise trillium. So yellow petals and yellow stamens. So if you find that, that is an exciting find. Again, it's still just trillium recurvatum, the regular purple trillium, but it's got yellow petals and yellow stamens. And then also rare, I think this should ease, I think this could be a candidate for um, listing as threatened or endangered in Illinois, the Cecil Trillium. 
I've only seen rarely. And as you can see the um, the, the, the sepals, which are the green parts under the petal, they're spreading. So on the recurvatum, we were just looking at the sepals point straight down. They're recurved, hence the name recurvatum. But these are spreading. And that's one way to distinguish it. Trillium sessile. And then the rarest of them all, the green trillium. This trillium species only occurs in Missouri and Illinois. And Illinois, there's less than 10 known populations. In Missouri, it's actually quite common. So it's not, uh, you know, rare uh, globally because of its presence in Missouri. But in Illinois, not very many populations. And they have varying colors of petals, but typically they're greenish or green colored, sometimes with purple parts to them. So Trillium viridi, very rare, Illinois endangered. Wild Columbine is another fun one. This is also really difference in where it likes to grow. It's a prairie plant in a lot of parts of Illinois and it occurs in prairies, but in, in a lot of other parts of the state, it's a cliff species. It grows only on rocks and on cliffs, particularly in the southern part of the state. This is a very common cliff species and I never see it really growing outside of that. But there's my wife, Susan, with a nice patch that we saw on Kincaid Lake. But this one is just extraordinary, I think, the bishop's cap. So this is what we refer to as a glacial relics species. So in southern Illinois, there was no glaciation. It was a refuge for plants uh, during the Ice Age. And this was one that basically migrated south as the climate cooled and persisted in, you know, shaded moist canyons and then the glaciers receded and the plants migrated back north and they stayed in these microclimates that were similar to northern conditions like i said shaded moist north facing um sandstone cliffs and ravines and beautiful little snowflake like petals on the bishop's cap the the the, the leaves are paired so diphyla means two leaves and the leaves are pointy kind of like a bishop's cap and that's why they call it that. And I think, how can a plant with such an extraordinary wildflower be named after its leaves? Come on, people. <laughs> Beautiful wildflower, that one. And there's a few more before I go in to talk about a few shrubs here. This is doll's eyes, which also occurs statewide. You can see the fruits there with the creepy doll's eye look to them with the black spot on them. But this is uh, definitely a, a beneficial wildflower, a fairly conservative plant that can be indicative of high quality habitats. So interesting thing about this is it's sometimes called white baneberry. Um, you, and there's a red baneberry, but you can have a white flowered white baneberry a, or a red flowered white baneberry or a white flowered red baneberry or a red flowered red baneberry. So the flower color isn't really the thing to look to identify these. It's actually the pedestal. And the pedestal is the stalk of the flower, which in the picture on the right, you can easily see those are the red parts, the stalk with the seed, or the fruit on the end of it, that, that stalk part is the pedestal. And on doll's eyes, it's thick, it's pretty wide. So this is the thick version. And on red baneberry, it's very skinny and lean, narrow uh, pedestal. So that's the real way to tell those two apart. And then, oh my gosh, be still my heart the glorious yellow lady slipper orchid, just exquisite. This is a common orchid throughout Eastern, Eastern North America, although becoming much less common now than it used to be because of deer browse, habitat destruction, and poaching. A lot of people, unfortunately, unethically dig orchids and move them to their home or for their own pleasure. And orchids... Um, need soil mycorrhizal fungus to germinate and to grow. And so they don't transplant well. Most of the time, an orchid is just going to die when it's dug up. So it's always good to remind folks to don't not to dig up, you know, any wild orchids. But in Illinois, we have, you know, probably in most counties, there are sites where we have the yellow lady slipper orchid and they, they are just beautiful. I can never get enough of seeing those. So let's move into a few shrubs before I wrap up the talk. Um, red bud, everybody knows red bud, beautiful pink flowers. So, you know, I, I, I like to highlight that, you know, we have invasive species like um, buckthorn and bush honeysuckle that are shrubs that 
are displacing native vegetation and and often people um like the those plants in the sense of it's a privacy you know screen or whatever and so if they are asked to remove them the common question is well what can i put there instead so that's why i'm kind of highlighting some of these spring bloomers that i think are excellent um, replacements for the invasive shrubs that are throughout our woodlands so there's the red bud which is uh, a legume it's uh, has a um, in the pea family and an interesting thing about this is it has a phenomenon that's called cauliflory. And it refers to, it basically means stem flower. And it refers to the fact that the flowers come right out of the trunk sometimes. They're not, uh, they're not usually off on the, a separate um, twig. They're, they're coming right out of the branches uh, on the tree. And they do produce a lot of flowers. And there's actually white varieties as well that I've seen. But most of the time, they're, they're pink. Uh, we have pawpaw throughout the state, although much less common in Chicago land. And the pawpaws, again, this is a um, maroon colored wildflower. So it's attracting carrion feeders like um, beetles and flies and things. It's another confused dicot because it has three sepals and three petals. So that's usually monocots that do that. But in this case, it's a dicot. Very distinct feathery um, naked buds there on the, on the twigs. And of course, produces the edible fruit that is um, much prized by wildlife and in even humans. Now, service berry is the one that I really like, and it blooms early. They, I think that they can be a little more challenging to find in the nursery trade. And uh, the ones that I've heard about, sometimes a little bit on the expensive end, but it is a long-lived tree. So um, I think it's worth trying to incorporate this one into landscaping projects. Um, the service berry, coincidentally, often you hear people say that it had to do with during the, you know, in the, in, the, in the earlier times, the people living in the Appalachian Mountains weren't able to bury their loved ones in the wintertime because the ground is frozen. So the coffins would get sort of stacked up outside until they were or, or somewhere cured until they're ready to be buried in the spring. And so the pastors would know that spring had arrived when the service berry bloomed, and that meant that they would go perform the services throughout the mountains where the people who had died over the wintertime. But I later learned that that is um, a folk tale that is probably not true. And it actually, the name service berry comes from the word sarvis, S-A-R-V-I-S. So there was a similar species, uh, I think in Rome, that they called the sarvis tree. So is really service berry came from changing the pronunciation of the sarvis berry, actually service berry. And then it's also called shadbush and juneberry because those names also refer to um, natural things that occur when this species blooms. So the shad, the shad is a fish that runs upstream to spawn. And so you know when you go fishing for shad, uh, when the shadbush blooms. And then juneberry, of course, referring to the berries ripening in June, favored by wildlife. The birds just love service berries. So it's a good one all around. And then we have a couple buckeyes as well. In the southern part of the state, I think it's actually quite rare, um, is the red buckeye. I've been to all the sites that I can find for this. I think there's about seven or so. Um, but Horseshoe Lake down in Alexander County has a large population of the red buckeye, which, you know, the red flowers are pollinated by uh, hummingbirds. So a lot of people like to put some red flowers in their yards. But we also have the regular Ohio Buckeye, which has the cream colored flowers. And in DePage County is the national champion Ohio Buckeye in Oak Brook. There's um, the Hyatt Lodge there. This is formerly the McDonald's corporate campus has uh, a Ohio Buckeye that was planted in the 1800s. And it's the largest Ohio Buckeye in the nation. So take that, Ohio. Illinois has got the national champion. And one what I remeasured last year. And then just a few more here, um, there's black haw and there's rusty black haw that are viburnums. And viburnums are terrific. They The flowers are pretty short-lived, but uh, I think the foliage is pretty. And, and the flowers, even being short-lived, are quite beautiful. So this is a one that I definitely think is a good replacement. Um, of course, in the northern part of the state, you have nanny berry, which I think a, pop, a lot of people do use, a, a viburnum lentago, um, and some other ones as well. So this is a good genus of plants that and there, and there is a few non-native ones, so be aware of that. But the native variety is definitely good ones to promote. 
Bladder nut is also statewide. It's a shrub that often grows in large uh, colonies in like mesic areas. You see the flowers there that dangle down. They actually produce a, a papery capsule with the seeds inside. And it looks like a little Chinese lantern kind of thing. And you can, it's a little rattle box when the seeds fall and you can shake them around inside that papery capsule. So that's a cool one. And then just a couple more. These are rare. This is the silver bells, which also you can find in the nursery trade. There's actually one planted at the Morton Arboretum. Um, so it, it will do well, apparently, outside of its native range. It only occurs naturally in Illinois along the Ohio River. So down like near Metropolis in Massac County. But we have a number of locations for it. And they just have beautiful bell-shaped flowers. Just really a, a neat tree and quite rare. And then lastly here, the wild azalea. So this is also rare in Southern Illinois, just three counties. We have the rhod uh, rhododendron pronophyllum. And these are very fragrant. In fact, we joke and say, you can smell the wild azalea before you see them because they are pleasantly fragrant, um, like bubble gum. It's like cotton candy. It's really um, a sweet smell. And then large, beautiful flowers as well. And then they're not very common. So I've been to all the... While the azalea populations in Illinois, I think there's about 10 or so. So there you have it, presentation on the spring ephemeral wildflowers of Illinois. I 